Hello everybody and welcome back to this um, lecture number five. So we are progressing on our path. Um, the last session was devoted to situational leadership. We started off uh, laying down the first breaks to try to understand what this uh, situational leadership means, what does it entail, and uh, we are going to um, progress on that in this second lecture. Um, in, the, in, the, in the lecture number four, we were talking about a diagnosis. So remind that diagnosis was mostly focusing on uh, the collaborator, on the worker, uh, according to his or her degree of uh, development. Uh, we were assessing the commitment, the competence, the knowledge, and so on and so forth. And um, we were saying that uh, this diagnosis was very important uh, to be done, uh, bear in mind uh, the main objective and the main goal that you want to be achieved, especially by um, uh, inviting this collaborator to, to do. So after this point of diagnosis, which covered most of our uh, previous lecture, now we are going to uh, focus and concentrate on another concept. This concept is flexibility, okay? And it's very much uh, embedded within this uh, issue, with this, this, this framework of a situational leadership. Flexibility. So what do you see here in this picture? Well, it depends on how you look at it. You can see a the profile of a beautiful lady here, or you could see here with the mustache, the nose, the image of an old man. Okay, so it depends very much on how you, how flexible you, 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 you see at things. So basically, when we are talking about this flexibility, when we are, um, especially linking this concept of flexibility to, um, situational leadership, we are uh, understanding the ability to use a range of different leadership styles without difficulty. To move a, with a certain flow, with a certain facility, understanding what is the situation you have in front of you, which is the type of collaborator you have in front of you, and according to that, how easy do you manage this relation? So that's going to make you a better situational leader. Uh, in the in in the manner in the way you can use flexibly your assessment your perception to adapt a uh, an influence uh, or your influence towards a collaborator so leadership style is the pattern of behavior you adopt with others as they perceive it so okay when we were talking about uh, leadership don't forget this issue of influencing it is important to know that leader leading is trying to exert a certain degree of influence and of course you are by influencing someone you are adapting you are adopting a leadership style a sort of behavior a sort of energy that you want to communicate that you want to convey to the other in order to get or to or to achieve a, a certain objective so we are now Putting our uh, uh, the, the, the 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 coin on the on the other on the other we are going to flip the coin so we are not going now focusing on mostly on the collaborator now we are going to be mostly focusing on the leader and how this situational leader can work and can interpret their relation with the workers. Um, so when we are talking about leadership styles. It is important to start off with a question. Uh, we have said numerous times during these lectures the importance of this self-awareness. Okay, Everything starts with yourself. Do not expect anything from the collaborators, from other people, unless you start off first with yourself. So that's a very important thing. So when you are a leader, when you are leading a, 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 an organization, you have to be taking a step back again, ask yourself, should I provide direction or should I provide support? 
and that's very linked to the way do you understand leadership many times leaders believe that they have to be directive because they want to feel that they are respected giving direction it's giving orders it is much more vertical type of relation so many leaders might feel themselves more accomplished if they are seen by others as directors as someone who is able of giving all this top down but of course that's a question which is very much linked to this egocentric narcissist type of personality if you're a leader you might think that support that that direction can be used whenever it has to be used but don't believe that your role it should be only directive direction is a means that you can use in certain moments but should not pervade the entire set the entire catalog of actions that you may display so that's why we are also talking about this second question here should i pro uh, provide support direction and support are two different things i can be directive i can let you know what i want from you i want you to do this but i can reflect a little bit more and think okay no it's not that which is needed i need to show support to this collaborator to this worker so you are putting yourself in a situation where you are more a servant like okay i'm here to help you i'm here to understand you i'm using this instrument which is called the empathy that we were talking in lesson number three to understand your situation i understand that you need more support than direction okay so it is important that this flexibility entails or integrates these two concepts do i have to direct or do i have to support so you have to be flexible and you have to move yourself quite easily between do these two extremes direction support so therefore the leadership behavior so it helps to develop the knowledge and skills necessary to complete a goal or a task leadership behavior this is the next step so in this image here and this uh, type of images have been used already uh, numerous times here in these presentations and what i'm showing you is that a leader is not someone who is you making to pull a a big car the leader in this case is showing you direction is showing you an objective is giving you is, is offering you his her hand in order to achieve all together a certain objective so the leader bringing the flag there in this image is showing this vision this commitment i'm here to help and to help you i can understand what do you need in a precise moment to achieve a task to achieve a goal they have to be directive they have to be supportive so as such the leader the vision it has to be the person setting the priorities you cannot be a leader if you are sitting in front of everybody without letting people what's the path to go ahead people working with you must know what is the road that you want to take so therefore you will have to set those priorities those main objectives in order to make sense of your actions and your decisions otherwise you are not going to be supported by anyone there you will to you will have to define goals so these are the milestones we want to achieve we want to achieve not i want you to achieve we are working together towards the achievement of those goals together and i help i'm here to help you according to your stage 
of development. You as a leader will have to define action plans. Okay, you will have to show it's a roadmap and show how to do it. And that's a question of authority too. If you are in front of someone and you are asking, oh, I'm expecting this from you, this someone is going to ask you, but can you teach me how to do it, please? If you cannot show him or her how to do it, well, that's going to be a problem because you cannot convey certain clear message in action how to do it. So you might be seen as someone who is asking to do something without really understanding. What do you want from them? Okay, I think that you have to be that, to, 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 to do this or that. Perfect. But how do I do it? Oh, I don't know. I, you do it. No, you have to show that. You have your, show your knowledge. You have to show your support, your direction if necessary. But you have to show the others how to do it. In terms of achieving goals and tasks, you will have to organize your team accordingly. You have to define clear roles and the expectations. Who is going to be doing what? This has to be very clear since the beginning. Imagine a sport team soccer or rugby whatever type of sports then the trainer is organizing the team players according to their expertise according to their competencies according to their knowledge they can place the people according to that you susan you are going to be doing that because you are good at it you, Peter, you are going to be doing that. You, James, you are going to be doing that. So Susan, Peter and James, they know what they are going to do. But Susan knows what James is going to do. And Peter knows what Susan is going to do too. So everybody, in order to achieve a certain objective, have to be informed who is going to do what. So it's not a question that I'm leader, I'm asking Peter to do a thing, a task, without informing James and Susan. I have to make clear who is going to do what, how is it expected to be done, and then to inform to the others how the entire picture is going to be achieved or developed. Don't attempt never to do a project, a new task, if you don't take into consideration this issue of this transversal communication, informing everybody about which are the roles, what do I expect from Susan, why do I expect from Peter, why do I, what do I expect from James. Clear roles and expectations, clear transparent communication. Okay, so imagine that you are piloting a, an airplane, and this is very common from the from pilots, right? So you can be flying in a couple and you're steering the airplane, you're piloting the, the, the airplane and you have your assistant here, right? And given that it's a type of a risky activity, you will be, you will have to be very clear about your orders, about your instructions. So if you are giving the control to your assistant, you will have to tell him the control is yours. It's a ritual. Okay, it's a narrative. It's part of the of the rituals that they have to follow. Now I'm in control. Yes, I'm communicating. Now you are in control. Yes, now I'm in control. To make sure that everybody is doing what they do have to do and would do. Uh, I mean, um, and, and, and how uh, they have to do the things and their expectation. Then they will have to, the leaders, define deadlines. It is important for a leader to say, okay, this is the task. P 
Peter is going to be doing that, James that, and Jude as Susan that. I expect all of you to do these type of things, and this has to be achieved at that time. One month, one week, 10 days. Because otherwise you cannot monitor the progress. And you cannot monitor how they are performing. So it is very important to define deadlines in order to, to make sure that you can check the progress of your team towards the achievement of this specific activity. Then of course you have to evaluate and provide feedback. You cannot evaluate and provide feedback at the end of the task. You will have to apply a routine of partial checks, temporary, temporarily defined, when you are giving feedback and evaluating the progression of uh, your collaborators. So that's what is expected from a leader. So, in order to summarize this, you have to set goals, planning and organizing work, who does what, which are the roles, determining the deadlines, determining the methods to assess and control the quality of work, give feedback on results, training of employees. Because you cannot let, you cannot let people alone. If you want to, you, if, if you want them to perform, you have to take care of them. You have to train them to cover the gaps they may have. I need to learn German because we want to expand our market in Germany. Okay, you are very good at languages. I'm going to support you. You can learn German. I will give you some hours a day out of work so you can study German. Or I need to, to learn a new software. You have to be ready to invest in your employees in order to train them if you want them to perform and to be more motivated and achieve objectives. So you have to define the structure, have to organize the work, you have to train and you have to supervise. Uh, we have talked about the directive behavior, hmm? this, which is this very clear top-down type of hierarchical uh, way of directing people. And supportive behavior helps develop motivation and self-confidence. I mean, it is much easier to direct people than to become supportive. To become supportive, you have to be very clear with yourself. You have to know you very well. Only in that situation you can help others with your supportive behavior. You know how you to use this empathy, this instrument which is called empathy, to help that people according to their stages of, develop, of personal development, according to the goal they have to achieve. And it's much more about listening, about asking. You have to praise, you have to explain why. Sometimes you are in front of a, a baby, a toddler, he's a little bit stubborn. He is uh, racking your nerves and you're saying, no, please, clean that. Your room is mess, put him in order. Your son asks you, why? And you feel like, oh, why is he asking me why? You feel offended. No, I'm ordering you to put in place all these things in this room, which is a mess. Don't ask me why. Do it. Hmm? There's very clear examples in our life about this type of behavior. Don't ask me why. Do it. Well, if you are a leader, a supportive leader, a supportive father, you might step back a little bit and you may ask, why? 
Well, because this is a mess, this has to be properly organized now, put in order, because uh, otherwise, I mean, if we in this house do whatever we want, the house is going to be a mess. So everybody in this house has to take care of his or her things and try to help the others to keep a certain order inside. So everybody will have this certain responsibility here. So it is more tiring if you want, emotionally speaking, because you will have to explain the reason why you're asking him or her to organize the room. It could be much easier to say, no, come on, don't ask why, do it. More directive. So you have also to facilitate the problem solving. So your kid could ask you, oh, but I don't know how to put this. You can show him, look, put these small pieces in this place, the big places, the big pieces in this place, this toy is here. You show the, the, the kid how to organize the things, how to solve those small problems by splitting the difficulty of the task. So there is nothing wrong with helping your son, in this case, to put in order the, the, the room. You are showing him or her how to solve this problem. So it's not a question of, do it! I'm also showing you how to do it. I'm helping you with this problem solving. And, of course, according to that, and link to that, you share information about your experience. Because you have done these tasks of putting things in order many times, so you can help him or her to do it properly. And then you will have to share information about the organization, like we are a family, we are a number of people living here, we all have a role here, we all have something to do, what I'm expecting to you to do is this. So you can see it's a very, uh, organizations at the end of the day are human organizations, where behaviors, different behaviors are within it. And you have to deal with this type of emotions, with the people in a situational model in order to make things work. Otherwise, you might be screaming and shouting all, all day long, right? And normally, listening is one of the most important things. If you are a boss, you normally tend to blah, 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 blah. It's a very, very self-referencing type of discourse. No, I know that, I know that, I know that. That's why I'm the boss. Whereas it is much more important to show your authority by listening to others. Tell me more. How can I help you? What's your problem? Why are you encountering this problem? Have you done in the past something similar? Do you have failed or succeeded in doing this? Can I help you? Do you think that among our colleagues it is someone who can help you to do this? Do you have enough time for that? Do you, need, do you need more time? Maybe you need some support or training to improve certain skills which are going to be beneficial for the achievement of this task. Listening, asking, listening, asking, listening, asking. Okay? Otherwise, it is going to be much, very difficult for this person, for the collaborator, to try to understand the sense of what you, they are doing. You have to show them support. You have to show them a vision. You have to show them that you inform transversally across the organization and you explain the role, what is expected from them. In this sense, supportive behavior includes encouragement, reassurance and appreciation. This is an important part of the firm's work. What you are doing that if you are a situational leader, if you are displaying this supportive behavior, or if you are imposing a directive model, you are creating, you are shaping the organizational culture. So what type of organizational culture do you want to develop as a leader? Do you want to develop a culture which is rooted 
on fear, mistrust? Or do you want to make growth an organization with an open approach, with a participatory, participatory approach, where everybody belongs part of the team, where everybody knows what they are doing and why they are doing that? Do you want an organization where people free, feel free to speak, to share the knowledge? Do you want an organization where by sharing this knowledge, the organizational capital, the organizational culture could develop and grow? I'm sure you want, as a leader, this type of organization. You are investing in your organization's culture. It involves decision-making through suggestions. Okay, let's do that. Try to do it. Do you think that should... Okay, go ahead. Do you feel confident to do it? I think that probably you might have this problem with this approach, but let's try it out. Then you ask for feedback. How is it going? And he or she might say, okay, it's going okay. I failed here. I overestimated this issue. And then you will have to explain why. The encouragement of the autonomy in problem solving. That's a very important part of the French work. Culture. Organization and culture. Which type of organizational culture do you want to develop? Encouragement of the teamwork. You have to encourage, listen, question and explain. But how much direction and support it's needed? From high to low? From D1 to D2 to D3 and D4? Direction and support. The pink line, direction, the black line, support. Remember all the characteristics of these profiles, D1, D2, D3, and D4. The beginner is very enthusiastic. Really willing to do the things. But he or she need a lot of direction. Clear objectives, clear action plans, clear milestones. So because it's super motivated, you don't need to support him or her much. But then, as we have seen, the motivation decreases, and then in D2 and in D3, you might need to be much more supportive. And less direction is needed. Because you have to show people that you are understanding them, you are listening to them, their problems, their needs, you are asking Okay. You, as a situational leader, you will have to, in these two phases, show your support. Here you will have to show in the one your direct your direction. Here in D2 and D3 you have to show much more the support. When you are dealing with experts, it's not much more important. Direction and support, we are almost talking with peers. Of course, in that case, direction and support can be very low because the, pe the person, people, are autonomous, are independent. They can work. So, when we are talking about these situational leadership styles, we have basically the same graph that we have here, which is the low to high supportive behavior and low to high directive behavior, where in S1, this situational leadership style, we have to be high in uh, direction and low in support. In S2, you have to be high in support, low in direction, 
Okay. So basically what we are seeing here in this graph on our right hand side is how do we define these leadership styles according to these stages? In this one, you have to be directive, high directive and low supportive behavior. S2, it's called coaching. It is high directive and high supportive behavior. The third phase is supporting, high supportive and low directive behavior. And S4, it's delegating, low supportive and low directive behavior. So this is how do we have to be flexible at. Am I dealing with an S1, with a D1, with a D2, with a D3, or a D4? So do we have to behave as a S1, S2, S3, or S4 according to the person I have in front of me? Do I have to be directive with an S4? What will happen if I'm directing with an S4? I will have a conflict, I will have a clash. What could be, what would happen if I am delegating with a D1? It will be a mess, because he doesn't have the knowledge to do certain things. What could happen if I am supporting, supportive in, in D1? The same. So the situational leader, by assessing, by diagnosing who have in front of him, can adapt his type of leadership. It can be directing, it can be coaching, supporting, or delegating, according to the person I have in front of me, and according to the task they have to develop. Leadership styles, therefore, is one you have to define and clarify. Planning and prioritizing. You have to orientate, instruct, show how it is done, control and monitor, and give feedback. We have said already in the present minutes the general characteristics of the leader, but now we are placing which are the main activities that we have to do according to each profile of situational leadership. In S2, have to be more questioning and exploring, explain, enlighten, redirect, correct, share feedback, encourage, and evaluate. In S3, I say, situational leader in front of the D3, I will have to question and listening more than exploring. Reassure, facilitate the problem solving. He has a certain degree of autonomy. So you have to facilitate this problem solving, which is not a characteristic which is present, for instance, in S2. You have to show this collaborative approach, have to be supportive there. Encourage the feedback and show appreciation. So you are supporting the individual here. In S4, you are delegating, so you have to give trust. You have to empower that person, pressing, you have to recognize that person you have to trust, stimulate the work the person is doing. So there are several attributes that fit into each box. Of course, all those boxes are not closed. They are not silos. They are interconnected among them. So the situation is much more complex, right? It's not that the question of, I am acting as an S1, S2, S3, S4. While you can be flexible by adopting a leadership style for S1, S2, S3, and S4, you have to be even more flexible to try to understand 
If there is something between S1 and S2, S2, S2 and S3, and S3 and S4. So that's the flexibility that you have to show as a situation leader, not only applying by the book the characteristics for each one of these four boxes, but believe that these four boxes are communicating among themselves and that therefore you will have to readapt according to whom you have in front of you your type of leadership. Again, AB1 can have some elements of, is, is, uh, of, of D2, so you will have to adapt all these styles with flexibility and moving across this diagram in a fluid manner not in boxes. Silos is one, silos is two, silos is three, silos is four. No. Flexibility obliges you, forces you to navigate freely across these boxes. They are not closed silos. That's very important.